Welcome to Gustavo's Earth Shaking Seminar. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to try to do justice to your bios, um, but we don't have much time, so I can't go over everything. But uh, you can also read it on Wikipedia. Gustavo is a computational biologist with 25 years of experience. Um, he was the CSO at GeneDX, and he led the research division at R&D strategy there. And before then, he spent 23 years at IBM as the founding chair of the Exploratory Life Sciences Program and the director of the Translational Systems Biology and Nanobiotechnology Program. Um, he has a PhD from Yale and has been named an IBM Fellow, ISCD Fellow, APS, and AAAS Fellow. So he's a big believer of open and reproducible science, and he founded the Dream Challenges that I don't know if you guys know, but... Um, for my generation of computational biologists, it was a really exciting times. And he was also the founder of the uh, Recom Systems uh, Genomics Conferences, where it used to be, I think the three years I attended, it was in New York City. And then after oh, yeah, we did a few here, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it was an exciting time for me because we were at New Haven and it was a great opportunity to come to New York and talk to other uh, systems biologists and computational biologists. Um, yeah, so with this, I'm going to... Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, well, it's a great pleasure to, to present to you guys some of the latest work I have been doing. But today I want to uh, focus mostly on, on this custom of implementing in the real world with the hospital and the providers and reach to patient impact from the cool science that we do. So the, I'm, I'm trying to uh, articulate uh, how we can think uh, about doing that. And uh, honestly, that's that's one of the great motivations for me to be, uh, you know, intervening in the department. So a few disclosures. I have share, shares from GeneDX and other companies, and I am in the board of directors and scientific advisory board of other companies. The outline of my presentation is basically, I'll tell you a little bit about me, a lot to, you know, that topic of conversation. Then uh, I'll discuss a little bit of some algorithms for rare diseases I work on, but then I try to understand the barriers for implementation of these algorithms in the real world and in relation to the quintuple aim. Um, I discussed some uh, issues about rep replicability and reproducibility of algorithms and benchmarking through the dream challenges and so on. And finally, I will discuss a little bit about the health economics implications of human AI collaboration. Finally, I will conclude. So my, my professional background is uh, a little bit alluded to them said before, I studied physics, statistical physics and chaos theory at the University of Buenos Aires. And then I came to the US to do my PhD uh, on the physics of turbulence. Uh, I transformed myself into more of a genomic, genomics guy um, uh, uh, through biophysics at the Rockefeller University from where I went to IBM, uh, where I spent 23 years. Uh, while at IBM, I was also a faculty for five years at Mount Sinai with a joint appointment and founded the Dream Challenges, co-founded the Dream Challenges. After IBM, I uh, left in 2021 to go and be the chief science officer in a, in a company that really does something directly associated with the needs of patients, which is GeneDX. And what I'm going to discuss next is some algorithms for rare diseases that I did at GeneDX. GeneDX, I don't want to make an advertisement of this, is a genetic testing company. So they are very much at the forefront of, as many other genetic testing companies, of how to use the new world of genomics and genetics uh, for patient uh, 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 impact. So let me discuss a few uh, bullet points of the unmet needs in rare disease diagnostics. Rare disease patients have what is called a diagnostic odyssey until from, from the moment in which they get the symptoms until the moment they get diagnosed. It's a, it's a long journey that uh, the question is, why does it take seven years for a patient to undergo so many studies until they get diagnosed? We'll discuss a little bit that. And also once they get a genetic test, 
uh, only 30% of them get a variant that may be causative of their disease. And the question is why, why only 30%? We shouldn't be satisfied with that. So discuss a little bit why that's the case. And, and, then, um, and then we discuss a little bit more about why those some of these algorithms sound very good, but actually are not very easy to implement in the practice. In the practice, so let's first discuss uh, an algorithm to address the shortcut to address the long diagnostic odyssey uh, through digital phenotyping. So, <clears throat> the patient journey from uh, for a rare disease patient or genetic uh, uh, a patient affected by a genetic disease from the first symptoms until the, the final diagnosis is tortuous. Uh, it starts with the first symptoms and uh, they go to visit a physician and typically phys typical physicians, primary care physicians in 94% of the cases are not uh, really well equipped to address rare diseases. So, uh, typically, the, the patient or the parents of a, of a kid that has a rare disease uh, would do internet search with Dr. Google and, um, and visit a specialist. In 44%, in 44 of rare disease uh, patients get a misdiagnosis when they start. They, you know, a specialist, you know, if you go to, to a, a, a plumber, uh, they will say that your problems are in the pipes, right? So uh, the same happens with cardiologists, neurologists, and so on. And 50% of, of uh, rare disease patients go for all their lives without uh, a good diagnosis. Then it comes to the moment in which they go to visit a, a specialist. And the specialist might not have the answer and they will go to another specialist. And in av on average, there are seven specialists that rare disease patients have to go and uh, see before at some point, someone will say, hey, why don't we give you a, a order for you a, a genetic test? At this point already has happened a, a lot of water under the bridge and um, Eighty percent of rare diseases uh, have a genetic component, so it, it is likely that the genetic test might address some of the causative problems of the symptoms. Um, this diagnostic odyssey takes sometimes five, seven, in some cases even more uh, time. So it's a long time to be sick and not knowing what you have. And it is also true that once you have the diagnosis, not necessarily you have a treatment. But at least you will know, you will give a name of what you have and you can find like patients that uh, can help each other and you know, lobby for, for more research in that field. Can we do a shortcut between the first symptoms, the first primary care physician until we get a genetic test? And, um, and that's what I'm trying to discuss. So we uh, developed with several collaborators at uh, um, GeneDX, this digital phenotype, um, digital phenotyping algorithm to guide pediatricians to tell them, to alert them, hey, this patient seems to have a rare disease that could be helped with a genetic test. And so that's what the digital phenotyping algorithm aims to do. Um, it is targeted for a population of, uh, of uh, uh, pediatric patients from birth to three year old, and it contains 13 EMR uh, derived rules that are, are not AI. These are, um, you know, common sense uh, rules designed by clinical geneticists. And then I will discuss a little bit the validation of this algorithm. This paper, this, this archive paper is where all what I, that I'm going to discuss uh, can be found and is under review in Orphanet Journal of Rare Diseases. So this gives a glimpse of the 13 markers or rule base that we, uh, we ask from the EMR is, uh, did the patient have multiple ER visits? Did the patient have some developmental delay? Uh, are there uh, image, imaging tests that ha have been done? Um, did the patient die? So that will be a marker that the serious uh, disease was happening. And some of these um, rules will be categorized into major and minor uh, uh, rules. 
and each of them will have a number, three, two, one, depending on their major or minor. Then we will add the 13 numbers and we'll create a score. So this, yes, this, these rules were chosen by experts? Yes, by clinical geneticists that, that you know, thought about what, what makes sense, yes. Uh, in a subsequent uh, work, we were looking at it from a more uh, machine learning uh, way of thinking using word to dog and uh, dog, uh, dog to back and so on, but this was rule based. So there is a classification criteria that we also have, which was numer not numerical that the fee index score, but it was just saying how many of these major criteria does the patient meet? For example, if it is more than two or this uh, meets one major criteria and one minor criteria or five minor criteria, then we will say this patient presents with illness with an increased risk for a genetic disease. Uh, when you look at the distribution of scores in the population, this is in log scale, we looked at um, about 100,000 patients. Most of them didn't have anything. Uh, and so the score is zero, but as the score goes up, the severity goes up and the classification that I mentioned before becomes more uh, of a one in the binary classification. This person is sick uh, with a genetic disease or not. So the orange means classifier said yes. And the blue indicates the, uh, you know, how many patients uh, had this uh, score in fee index. If you look at the... Uh, confusion table, we had that the, uh, uh, this was uh, looked at in a subset of patients by clinical geneticists that would say, yes, this patient requires a genetic test or not. So that was the ground truth to, to this classification. And uh, the sensitivity was 97%, specificity was 90%, accuracy is 94%. So just a vignette, of how we can use a simple algorithm to shortcut the diagnostic odyssey, which is a very serious problem for rare disease patients. Let's now jump to suppose that P index suggests, yes, have a diagnostic test because this person is likely to have a genetic disease. What happens at the genetic level with the variants that might be found? And so I will focus a little bit on the issues of VUSES, what is called VUS variant of an uncertain significance. So if you go to CleanVar, which is the database that has all the variants that, um, that are of clinical significance, 81% are variants of unknown significance. And only 11% um, are benign and about 8.5 are pathogenic or likely pathogenic. So majority of patients that get genetic tests get one or more variants of non-significance. In the GeneDx database, GeneDx has been around for a number of years, for many, many years, since, since uh, 20 years, one of the first companies that, that um, um, was spun out of the uh, NIH. Uh, they have 500,000 whole exome sequencing. And if you look at all the variants that GeneDx has in their databases, uh, they had 200 variants of uncertain significance and only 40,000, 200,000 voices and only 40,000 benign and 30,000 pathogenic. So you see that the voices plague uh, the reports of genetic testing and we don't know what they are. We don't know whether they are pathogenic or not. So... Um, Yes, whole exome sequencing, so all coding variants. So let's discuss a little bit the latest uh, and, and greatest algorithms that are there in order to classify VUSES into pathogenic or benign. And the, the, the big, there was a big, very interesting paper uh, in science last year uh, by the same company, DeepMind, that did AlphaFold. And this uh, algorithm was called AlphaMisense. So we apply AlphaMisense to the, to, the, to the variants that we discovered at, at GeneDx. And um, so if you, look, if you take all the pathogenic variants, the red ones here, this is GeneDx data, 
Then the score that alpha missions outputs is a number between zero and one. Most of the pathogenic variants have a score close to one. There is a very unimodal uh, mode at, at one. And all the benign variants that we have have a very strong peak at zero. Also, this we are discovering what we knew. Pathogenic have close to one, as as they as uh, Alpha Mistan says, and uh, and and the benign have uh, close to zero. Interestingly, let's look at the variants of unknown significance. We don't know whether they are benign or not. So, if you look at that, you have this beautiful bimodal distribution that indicates that there is signal. Uh, given by alpha missense that suggests the closer to one will be pathogenic, the closer to zero will be benign. Other uh, algorithm called REVEL, which is an ensemble of different algorithms to determine pathogenicity or, uh, or, or whether the variant is benign, has also a peak for the benigns close to zero. But look, this peak is much broader than this one. And a peak at one for the pathogenic, also much broader than this one. And the voices are not bimodal. This, this is the faint gray line that is basically uh, kind of a, a, a close to uniform distribution. So when we look at the scores given by alpha missense or REVEL, which uh, the scattergram is here, each point here is a variant. Uh, here, the pathogenic, benign, and variant of announcing uncertain significance. Uh, you see that there is there is some sort of complementary information that these two uh, algorithms uh, are uh, providing. And so this is an opportunity to use an ensemble, aggregate the two, because um, it's known that when you two have two algorithms, when you put them together, uh, the aggregate is better than the best if they are sufficiently independent. And so we did uh, that, but first we need to do something which uh, is necessary when you do these integrations, which is called a calibration of the score. And so we use a maximum entropy idea that if you know for each gene, the uh, area under the curve, basically how well the benign and the pathogenic are separated for the training set, then you can um, create a distribution of likelihood, a distribution of, uh, of prob a probability distribution that a variant is or not pathogenic. That, so, so here is for this particular uh, gene, STXBP1, uh, a distribution that is a maximum entropy. That means we don't need much information. This is the one that is best for the information we have. And the information we have is how well separated are the benign from, from, the, from the pathogenic and the ratio of pathogenic to benign. When we do this, uh, calibration for both um, uh, the REVEL and the alpha fold, then it allows us to use a, 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 a consensus integration that, that we um, design that eventually will allow us to test a test set. Uh, notice that this calibration and so on is, is, is sem semi-supervised. We, we are not training. We are using the information that we already had, right? And so we don't need labels. Um, so when we do that, the aggregate at the precision of 90 per, so, so what this, uh, uh, what we will use the, the existing data is to make a line to say all these variants that have a probability higher than this level will be called uh, pathogenic. When we do that at the precision of 99%, we get a recall of all the pathogenic um, um, variants of 80% when we do the aggregate versus about 50% when we do the individual REVEL and alpha missense. And uh, so this is a 30% improvement that is very important. We recover a lot more pathogenic than otherwise we would. Again, this is, um, this is just a vignette of uh, how to use AI and a little bit more of this uh, calibration and aggregation of, of algorithms in order to get uh, more uh, bang for the buck for uh, determining buses. But as you see, buses are a very important problem in genetics. Now I want to make a little bit of a jump to try to see, okay, we have these two algorithms. How can we use them really uh, to impact 
patients. And we'll focus more on this in terms of the fee index, the digital phenotyping algorithm. When I ask a, a, a clinical geneticist, oh, Lee, we have this beautiful algorithm, fee index, very simple, interpretable. Uh, tell me, uh, uh, what is the appetite in your health system to, to use it? Oh, she said, none. And these are the reasons why. These are all the barriers why she said, uh, very unlikely to be used, even though she sees the value of it. Uh, and the reasons are you know, kind of summarizing these points. Health systems might not have the appetite to implement these algorithms because it takes time, resources, support to do that. And so even though they may say, yeah, this is a good algorithm, you know, it doesn't work in the workflow of, uh, of the clinical uh, work. In, in this case, for example, should be pe uh, uh, pediatricians should use it. And so, you know, she said, my health system is not interested. There are no really economic incentives to use these things, like, like there was, in the past, when electronic health records had to be, you know, uh, organized, there were uh, incentives for this kind of algorithms. There are no clear incentives. There is a huge lack of geneticists in the country, and therefore, if something, if a pediatrician says, "I will uh, refer my patient to the geneticist," they will have to wait like three, four, five months sometimes, depending on where. Sometimes more. Pediatricians are not, not, not uh, really well trained to read these genetic reports. They are very good at other things, but this genetics thing, especially when it comes with the boost, that there can be some additional liability to them if they don't know how to interpret that, that eventually this boost, someone will say is pathogenic and, and is uh, causative of this disease. Then, you know, there is going to be a burnout to use this uh, as I said, the specificity was 90%. That means that a lot of the patients that we will say, uh, this patient might be a good candidate for genetic test, you know, is, is a false positive. You know, in, the, in the screening of 100,000 patients, maybe you will have, you know, um, 1,000 out, out of which 500 really need it. The other 500, they don't. So you see, there are lots of things besides the coolness of the algorithm or the usefulness in responding a scientific question. So this is where I, I want to think of these kinds of algorithms. And this is the reason why really I would like to, I would love to, to come to a department that is associated with the hospital is how to think this in the integrative way that the you know uh, uh, triple aim first, now quintuple aim, uh, tells us. So I would like to map these barriers that they mentioned before to where it's a pain point with respect to these dimensions in the quintuple aim and, and see whether we can uh, address some of this. So, so we, said, um, we said that the fee index can shorten the diagnostic odyssey. Clearly, this benefits the care experience, which is one of the important dimensions, because the patient doesn't have to go five, 10 years without knowing what they have. This would be very important. However, there is the barrier of health system integration of this algorithm. So what we need to do is talk with the, with the uh, 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 hospital administrations and the CIOs and, and so on to try to work with them and try, try to understand another topic that has to do with costs. Is this going to be cost efficient for the health system? So we need to do a health economics analysis that allows us to look at these two uh, and even the population health because there will be lots of pediatric patients. So we need to do what, what the authors of the triple aim uh, studies thinking is you cannot think of these specific top, uh, dimensions independently. You will have to think of them uh, as, as a whole, more holistically. Same thing with the pediatrician burnout and the uh, pre-authorizations and denials of payers. So that's the framework that they would like to use in order to think. And I will not solve the problem for, for us today, but what I, what I am saying is that this quintuple aim can be used as a framework to think how our algorithms can be used in the context of a health system. And more generically, for any algorithm, not just fee index, we may, need to, besides the cool science, map the 
barriers that may, uh, may exist and also the benefits of the algorithm to these dimensions. So, you know, in, in terms of uh, care experience, if I am a patient, what I want is the algorithm that you use is really accurate, as accurate as, because I don't want to be misdiagnosed and it's personalized for me. And in terms of population health, we need to make sure that these algorithms are reproducible, replicable. And in terms of costs, that we do a study of how these algorithms really have a cost benefit uh, you know, balance and so on. So let's then discuss one area of importance and very close to my heart, which is this concept of reproducibility and replicability, because that uh, impinges into the some of the dimensions, as we said before. So first the definition, because sometimes there is some confusion with respect to these terms. The National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine com Commission, the Committee for Reproducibility and Replicability to write this book, to, to, to study and, 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 and converge on, on this piece of work that I think is very good, worth taking a look at. Uh, but the only thing that I'm going to use today is to say that replicability is defined as obtaining consistent results across studies aimed at answering the same scientific question, each of which has obtained its own data. It's basically, okay, your algorithm is 95% um, accurate in this data set. Let's take it to another health system, see what is the accuracy here. Does it replicate your performance? Uh, reproducibility instead is obtaining consistent results using the same input data, the same computational steps, the same methods and code. This is where open source is the name or good encryption technology that will allow me to, at some point, get the key to reproduce. This is a paper that some of you may, may have read and know. This is a, a work that in 2010, uh, scientists from Amgen uh, did, took 53 papers from clinical uh, oncology, preclinical oncology, to, and, and took them into Amgen to see whether they could replicate the work, the work that was in those papers, the results, uh, in order to help in their uh, drug development process. And interestingly, only six of the 53 were replicated. The other ones were not, and not for lack of, uh, 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 you know, real intention to, for it to work. They went to each of these authors and said, help me reproduce it, and they, they couldn't. Now, we know that science is not perfect, that there are results that sometimes are a little finicky. The problem that we have as scientists is that the press takes these results and then make a big, uh, deal out of it as if all the science enterprise was wrong, right? And so we need to be very careful with this issue of repl replicability and reproducibility. A few more recent um, literature um, results uh, have to do with this. This, uh, this paper in science, I don't know whether you saw it, has a very uh, provocative title, Illusory Generalizability of Clinical Prediction Models. And what they did is take, um, a, a drug, that, five clinical trials from uh, uh, prednisone in schizophrenic patients and antipsychotic on schizophrenic papers. And they five clinical trials tested the drug in different places, geographies and populations. And they trained in one of the clinical trials to see who, according to 20, 257 uh, variates that included clinical uh, record information and, and other things, and they say, you know, they use the elastic net and, and say, can we predict who responds to the prednisone? And they train one uh, clinical trial. When they try to test who responds and not in the other clinical trials, they get a, a, an accuracy of about 0.5, you know, uh, AUC of about 0.5. That, that means random. Um, there may be reasons why this is happening, but, you know, the important thing is that it's not straightforward. And there, there was another paper in JAMA Internal Medicine uh, that uh, looked at the uh, EPIC sepsis model, famous uh, sepsis model by, by EPIC. And they showed that uh, while in the training, the AUC was 0.8, more or less, give or take, 
in their uh, test at the University of Michigan, it was about 0 0.6, 0 0.63. So again, another reduction when, when you try to generalize. And there are groups like the uh, Coalition for Health AI, CHAI, that are trying, and others, that are trying to make sure that uh, there are quality assurances with respect to the performance of these kind of algorithms. And so there is, there is, there is, there are problems and there are intentions to solve them. Why is this lack of replication uh, happening sometimes? Um, we did some studies, a study some time ago in which we looked at all computational biology papers and looked at authors trying to compare their, their, their results with, um, with other authors that solve the same problem. And in 81% of all the papers that we looked at, I think it was 50 papers or so, 87% of them said, my algorithm is the best. You know, we are very bad as, at assessing ourselves. We are biased, right? And in part is because we do selective reporting. We choose the metric that is most convenient. What we want is publish the paper. So convince and shut uh, the referees uh, up. But, but that's not the right way to do science in this case. And um, so, so that, that talks about replicability. Now let's talk about reproducibility. In January 2020, Google paper, uh, published a very interesting paper in which they said, hey, we can use uh, deep learning to interpret uh, mammograms and we can uh, predict the, whether a, a woman has cancer or not better than radiologists. Wow, big, big, this is a big uh, milestone for, for AI in radiology. However, there was no way to verify that because all that work was behind their firewall. There was no transparency in trying to see whether their claims were true. And I think that is best eloquently said by this uh, person, uh, Benjamin Haib Kynes, that was interviewed by MIT Technology Review, um, that, that again was kind of trying to uh, aggrandize the real problem. AI is wrestling with the replication crisis. I don't know whether it's a crisis. This is what happens in science. Science needs to have its own ways of control their results. But well, uh, what this guy said is, when we saw the paper from Google, we realized that it was yet another example of a very high profile journal publishing a very exciting study that has nothing to do with science. It's more an advertisement for cool technology and we can do anything with it. I think this is very important. We need to be able to see whether whatever colleague, whatever result a colleague gets, whether we know that colleague or not, we can reproduce it. We cannot just trust them. There are many cases, as I, as I showed, in which you know, the results were for, for good or bad reasons uh, inaccurate. This is something that I have been, it has been obsessing me for many years. And that's why in 2005, I founded uh, with Andrea Califano, uh, the, the Dream Challenges, which is basically a way to benchmark algorithms by leveraging crowdsourcing. So what, what do we mean by that? What, what, what do we mean by that? There is a, pro suppose there is a problem, uh, predict response to a drug. And we have one clinical trial. We know how to do it, uh, how to, uh, how, how, who responds and who doesn't. We have the labels. Uh, we are the organization. We can be Columbia, we can be Dream. We crowdsource the data, of course, not the labels, just the data. And we tell the people who, is int who are interested in working, tell us, do your work, do your machine learning work and create an algorithm that tells us who is responding and they will give us the proposed solutions and we will score them. Very simple, simple best practice, but this, is, this has uh, benefits as we will see in a second. So what are the benefits? Is that the evaluation is blind. There is no self-assessment here. Someone else is evaluating your algorithm. This is an apples to apples comparison. I'm not comparing my algorithm with somebody else that trained in a different data set, tested in different data set with other metrics. No, we are comparing apples to apples, all the algorithms to determine which are the best methods. 
And, and we can really address whether there is more information needed to solve this problem or whether we cannot solve this problem and because nobody of the 100 groups that participated were able to get better than 0.55 AUC, right? So now we can start to say, there is more information that this is needed, right? That this is, this is one way of looking at it. DREAM was also some effort that um, for me was essential, not just for people to compete, but for people to collaborate. So every year, like I'm said, said we create we we went to this conference that we that I co-organized with Manolis and and uh, Manolis Kelly and, and Andrea called Regulatory System Genomics uh, and and Dream Challenges, where we put together all the people that participated and we told them talk why your algorithm was better than mine why in what dimension my algorithm seems to be uh, uh, getting more from the data than yours and so on and so forth so collaboration. Collaboration is a very important thing. And I, I believe um, we don't pay enough attention to foster that collaboration. So the mission of the Dream Challenges is then to contribute to a solution of important biomedical problems, foster collaboration between research groups, make data accessible to everybody who wants to analyze it, uh, accelerate research, uh, and objectively assess algorithm performance. Over the years, we have done, I think, the count, I, I, I stopped counting a few years ago, but we had like 80 challenges that we curated. And Kaggle has done many more challenges in the world of AI. But the reason why Dream differentiates from Kaggle without, without criticizing Kaggle is that we finish a challenge, put people to collaborate through a, what we call a collaborative phase of the challenge, and we write papers, and we write papers such that they are really, try to be impactful. That's we publish in very high profile journals like Nature Methods, Nature Biotechnology, Science, um, Science Translational Medicine, Lancet, JAMA, and so on. So I want to discuss with you one particular paper that I think is relevant uh, for several reasons and, and addresses some of the things I want to mention uh, later, which is a, a mammography challenge to do through a blind testing what uh, Google claimed uh, they had done. And so the challenge question was, can you determine the cancer status of a woman given a, screen, a screening exam where you have a panel of uh, clinical and demographic information and you have the screening exam, the X-ray uh, plates, from this exam that you did today, but also from last year and the previous year, if available. And what you have to do is take that data and give me a number between zero and one, that is one if you are super certain that this uh, woman has cancer, and zero if you are super certain that, certain that, that she doesn't. So this data was provided by Kaiser Permanente Washington, and um, we're from registries, including the Breast Cancer Surveillance Consortium. We had 86,000 women. Some women went to more than one exam, so we had 146,000 exams and 650,000 images. All that was available through a method that we call model to data, which is kind of uh, what you need to do if you don't want that data to be downloaded because there are privacy issues. So the model goes to the data and runs where the data is. And uh, uh, I think we were pioneers in doing that. Now we see more of that in, in um, federated learning and federated testing, but we were doing this just 10 years ago. Results, no method did better than radiologist. So what you see here is the specificity at the radiologist sensitivity of the different algorithms. And this is the specificity of the radiologist that was 0.9, 90%, whereas the best one was 69% here. And this on the x-axis is the area under the curve. So two metrics to see how well they were doing. If these guys, which were from a company, uh, I don't remember the name of the company in France, uh, had one here, they will have gotten $1 million from the Arnold Foundation that funded us. They did it. Um, generalizability or replicability. So how does these same algorithms work in another data set? So we work with the Karolinska Institute that had another 
a big data set and we use the same algorithms and run in the same images, the same format of images uh, as we had run in the calcium permanent data. And what you see in the y-axis is the performance of each algorithm, each, each circle in the Karolinska Institute and in the uh, Kaiser Permanente. And what we are seeing here is the AUC. So as you see, the, the uh, and this here is the specificity. So AUC is specificity. In both counts, there is almost no difference or no significant difference between the way in which they perform in, uh, in one data set and the other. So that's one step towards demonstrating generalizability. But in order to really demonstrate it, you have to do it in, I don't know, five, 10, 10 different places with different subpopulations and so on and so forth. But this is, this is what I think should be a normal best practice. Blind evaluation in different data sets that are independent. The last thing I want to say about this is that, let's take a look at this, this table. This, talks about the specificity at the radiologist sensitivity. And so the specificity of the radiologist was 90.5%. The best individual was 69%. When we aggregate in a consensus score, uh, all the algorithms, that was 76%. Remember that we showed in alpha, missense, and revel how to aggregate and you get more mileage. This is the interesting thing. When you add, the radiologies to the ensemble, you get 92% specificity, more than the radiologists alone, and definitely more than the ensemble of algorithms. Now you might say, well, this is a 1.5% improvement. This seems to be not very important. However, in the 40 million, this is, remember, a, an increase in the specificity. So at 40 million exams per year in the US, 1.5% uh, means that a lot of women, about half a million women, will not go through follow-up studies, which will save the health system uh, uh, $500 million. So it's not trivial when you are doing screening to increase the specificity in this amount. Which leads me to the um, last piece of, um, of my presentation, which is, human AI collab collaboration, uh, how should it be done? And what is the economic implication of doing it? Because, you know, you know there is, there is this, this um, consideration in, about AI is that it's going to leave a lot of people without a job, but that, that could not, as we saw, AI plus uh, radiologists is better. So, but also there is, there is some, uh, economic consideration to, to, to balance. So let's take a look at, at it. And I want to put this in the context of, also of, is this human AI collaboration going to be of any interest to the, to the health system? So that's why, so if you look at just the, the cost of this, this is definitely going to be interest, interesting. And you are trying to not just say, I have a good accuracy, you also will say, I have a good way to improve the bottom line of the health system, which is, which is health and cost. So the formulation of the decision rules for this human AI collaboration uh, are based on three strategies. The first strategy is expert alone, like today, most, in most cases, don't consider the CAD um, um, assisted diagnostic. So it's basically the, the radiologists look at the image in a dark room and then identifies a lesion and says uh, sick or healthy. Uh, if, if, they are, if they seem to have a cancer, then they are recalled to follow up studies. The delegation strategy is the AI looks at it if the risk, remember I said a risk between zero and one, if the risk is sufficiently low, then the woman is sent back home. But if it is higher than a threshold, then the radiologist will make the decision. And this is where uh, D of R, the decision rule, is if the risk is less than a threshold, the uh, delegation uh, strategy says healthy. Otherwise, it goes to the expert uh, and, and they can say healthy or sick. And finally, is the automation rule itself, which is uh, healthy or sick only algorithmically 
but the threshold will be different than the threshold that we use for humans. So let's define the economic problem that we want to address. Uh, there are a few parameters to, to discuss, the cost of using an algorithm, the cost of using a human health expert, the follow-up procedure for positive finding sonograms or biopsies, the expected cost of litigation if there is a false negative, you know, the woman had a cancer, but the, the, the system didn't detect it, um, and the prevalence of breast cancer in the population. All those are the parameters that we are going to use. And the optimization problem is going to be the following. All this will cost. Every exam costs. What is the cost if it is the expert alone, the radiologist? What is the cost for a delegation? And what is the cost for the automation? Each one's with the opt optimized uh, threshold. And we will take the strategy that minimizes the cost, either expert or delegation or automation. Just to give a sense of how you formulate this cost, uh, this cost let's take a look at one of these slides because looking at all is a little bit um, tedious. But for example, the expert is the easiest, consists of the, the salary of the radiologist, uh, for per per uh, X-ray exam for per exam, the proportion of positives of sick people, not necessarily true positives, also false positives, uh, multiplied by the cost of the follow-up, and also the proportion of false negatives times the cost of the litigation. So you formulate this for both the for all the strategies, and you run. Uh, you run the optimization and you, and I don't show it, but there are very nice analytical results for this, but these, these are the results in graphical form. So what you see here is uh, in the X, in the Y axis is the algorithm performance. And in the X axis is the human performance. And you have to take into account amongst other things and all the, so we use specific numbers taken from the literature, but let's take a look at, at uh, three regimes, low algorithm cost and low litigation cost. And let's jump to high and high. Here is high and low, but let's jump from one to the other. So here we see something more or less obvious. If the, um, if the human performance is high, say 90% as they are, in, uh, in sensitivity, but the algorithmic per performance is not so high, then you want the expert. But as soon as the algorithm performance is a little higher, even if it is not even as high as the, uh, as the radiologist, then you want a delegation. And eventually, when the algorithm performance is super good, you want just the algorithm. Of course, there is a, a, a break here, and. Uh, here, the, the human performance is so good that no goodness of the algorithmic performance will allow you to decide the algorithm. This, when the cost of the algorithm and the litigation costs um, are, are high, then the range in which you can delegate shrinks. But you see here that there are ways of thinking of whether you, know, whether you use human AI collaboration in, in, in this particular uh, variety. There could be other ways in which humans and AI could collaborate. We just use these decision rules. Could be helpful to determine uh, that an algorithm could be deployed because it minimizes the, re the, the cost for the health system. So let me summarize and conclude. So we said, we discussed uh, AI-based models or rule-based models, also a little bit of uh, statistical uh, models, and they offer great opportunities to address unmet needs in different areas of therapeutic areas, and we discuss the rare disease patients. However, and that was what I was trying to emphasize through the talk, rigorous and cool science is not enough to align, to attain patient impact and to align with the healthcare uh, important uh, considerations. Not that the, that is not necessary, but it's like it's not enough. It's like a more complex optimization problem. It's not just the optimization of 
solving the problem is the optimization of solving the problem in the context of the healthcare. And when you have multiple targets, the optimization will give you a, another solution, so kind of another way of thinking of it. Patient impact can be accelerated if models are thought in the context of this quintuple aim, which provides some framework. It's not the Bible. It's not, it's not the, the, the fundamental truth given by anybody, but it's a good set of criteria to think of the health system needs. A medical school like Columbia offers the opportunity to collaborate across all layers of this ecosystem of, of healthcare and research in specific therapeutic areas. <clears throat> the, the crowdsource challenges uh, are a great mechanism for benchmarking algorithms and evaluate the rep reproducibility and the replicability. <clears throat> and the health economics implications of our algorithms is an important element to integrate our work to the quintuple aim framework, and in particular to the bottom line that some of health systems need, which is sustainability and so reduction of costs. And that was my talk. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much for the great talk. So I wonder what it, that does it take to put together the dream challenge? Because I would, you know, that's definitely a great model for solving a lot of problems. And I wonder, you know, suppose in the future we want to put together a dream challenge for rare disease. So what does it take? You know, how is it funded and how do you get the data sets? It looks like you get some data sets from Kaiser. And yeah, can you share some experience and advice? Yes, absolutely. And actually, I would like to do a, a dream challenge on a PRS course. I think it's very much needed. Mm -hmm. um, so it varies. It depends on the appetite. For example, in some cases, we get funding from a foundation, the Arnold Foundation gave us the funding to do the, the mammography challenge, even they would have given a million dollars. They were very happy that nobody won, by the way. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, in other cases, um, some people write grants and if they, um, they get funded, uh, in the grants there were uh, provisions for dream challenges and many dream challenges are done like that, like a, a somatic mutation calling challenges There were uh, uh, three or four challenges that came out of that, that came from these kinds of grants. And in some cases, um, pharmaceutical companies are interested in using their internal data in order to answer questions that their researchers were not able to answer. So we did that with Bristol Mar Myers Squibb. In, they, they had a checkmate um, a clinical trial that didn't, wasn't successful, but still they thought that the transcriptomics data that they had was going to be good enough to determine who could be benef benefit with respect to the standard of care from their PDL1 inhibitor. And, uh, and, uh, and we run the challenge and they paid. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it varies. It's a little bit of an opportunistic thing. And sometimes if you are charming enough, you can convince people to work on this without even paying because that's part of their postdoc or their uh, uh, you know, basic research and aligns with them, they already have the data and they are interested in getting something out of it. If nothing else, a very interesting you know, high-profile publication, but they can get you know, some very interesting science and, and biology out of it. Yeah, I, I will follow up with you more questions that other Excellent. people ask. <clears throat> Thank you so much. This is a, a fascinating talk. I wanted to ask about the last part of it when we talked about the economic model. Uh, you focused on very particular criteria there. Have you thought about- You mean that for the, for the uh, health economics model? Yes. Uh, but when you uh, uh, talked about the quintuple- the, Quintuple A. I yes. have to learn how to pronounce that. <laughs> there are other factors involved yes. in that. Yes. Have you thought about using that as the foundation for uh, Mathematizing all of the 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 health impact, the uh, provider burnout, and using that as an evaluation framework in the mathematical sense, the way you did it with the economic model. No, I haven't, and I think it's a very it, it's necessary to have that in something. And this is exactly the kind of thinking that we need to have in order to understand how to get the health systems, Colombia or others to buy in 
the use of these algorithms. How is this going to help them reduce the, the, the provider burnout or reduce the costs, you know, and, and so on, or serve a bigger population that will bring more revenue? All that should be incorporated in these models. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. So this rare disease stuff is a little bit confusing for me always, and uh, maybe it's my uh, you know ignorance. But so my understanding is that they are mostly Mendelian. So there is one gene that is affecting. We just don't know what it is. But if we look at our mutations in a regular human, we have only so many general mutations, right? So and only very few of them are hitting exons. So why not just look at the rest of the population? If this person has a mutation that doesn't happen in any other people in our population, uh, why not just designate that instead of going through all of these pathogenicity um, calculations? Let me see if I understood your question, but it's a, uh, if it is what I think, it's a very good one. It's like, um, let me rephrase it. Mendelian, dis rare diseases are typically Mendelian because otherwise it wouldn't be rare. They will be in a higher proportion in the population. So yes, then there will be a few uh, variants. These variants, uh, only 30% of the ones that we look today really give an answer to the genetic uh, disease to the patient. So the question is, why don't we do more to look at where else it is? Well, why not in the non-coding region, the structural variants, using long reads, yeah. as we said uh, this morning, but also beyond that, why don't we go beyond that and try to use the different reference genomes? Right now we are using one. And the biobanks and the different reference genomes, and all of them. And Absolutely. The reason is in the bottom line. Is it cost effective or not? And it's not a good answer, but it's the reality of it. When I tried a GeneDX to say, let's get rid of this, um, um, AG19 reference that we are using. Let's use the new ones or the pan genomes. Let do, let's do equitable work by looking at the specific subpopulations. Uh, it was, are you crazy? You know, the work that it takes to do that and the efforts that it will require. So, the, so it's not that they don't see it, is that what we were saying before is not, is not convenient cost-wise. Um, and, and also, you know, I try to create this long read uh, cohort in order to associate diseases that we cannot solve with short read uh, by doing whole genome, but, but with long read that you can identify, you know, much better regions of, of structural variants and so on. But um, again, all our data sequencers in these companies are Illumina short reads, so they don't have a lot of ways of doing it. They are not qualified and so on. So it's a lot of work. They say we have bigger problems of sustainability. You know, some companies like a famous company called uh, Invite went belly up. Uh, 23andMe is, you know, not doing very well. So all these companies need to be sustainable. They are doing a good job, right? But simply they don't have uh, sufficient funding to go and do these extra research and development things that is essential in order to. But um, the thing is, we shouldn't be satisfied with that, right? Then we say, what is the cost benefit of looking at long rates? Because if we can say we increase the, the, um, the diagnostic rate from 30% to 40%, 45%, we will capture a lot more clients, right? Because they will see that we do that and others don't. Let's do the ma mathematics of the cost that it, so we invest and there will be a return of investment. So that kind of thing, I think needs to be done all the time because you have to convince not only the researchers, they are typically convinced that some things of that sort need to be done, but also the people that are funding all these things. And that's the ecosystem that we need to have in Tokant. Are there any questions in the Zoom? Uh, any question in, in, the, in the Zoom? It's not here. <laughs> the person higher uh, thank you so much. Lots of really exciting topics that uh, seem of particular uh, relevance to the kinds of things that we're doing. I think you're you're speaking to the choir here. 
uh, secondly, with like respect to reproducibility, odyssey really embodies that. Um, and uh, your other department that really embraces human centered AI. And as we transition to a learning health system here at NYP, I'm sort of curious about you know, you talked about quite a few different areas. Where do you think we should, you know, on day zero, what should we focus on first? Uh, where would you like to for us to either it, from a research perspective or an implementation perspective of the health system? So there are two ways to think of that. The one is opportunistically and where there is more funding, and the other one is where there is the, the, the most serious and met need, right? So if we look at the, the latter one, we have in this country an, uh, uh, epidemics of obesity, epidemics of, 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 um, of uh, diabetes, and chronic kidney disease is a very serious problem in general. So maybe we should focus on that if we want to address the population health problem. But on the other hand, we need to also do with what we have. So we have a very good cancer center here. So cancer is well funded. Maybe we should do that. We should do women's health because there, there, there is a center that is focusing on that and there is money also in that. So uh, all, it's not that this not, you know, diabetes is important. A lot of people suffer from it, but uh, woman health and cancer is also very important. So we have to find the balance between what we think is the most serious and net need and also the opportunistic funding that we can get without which we don't go anywhere. And I didn't answer your question, I realized. But the, the, the thing is, where are we in this balance? And so maybe we have to be thinking, what, what do we really want to solve and have several horizon, time horizons to impact and start with a shorter ho horizon doing with what we have cancer or, or women's health or rare disease. And the longer horizon should be the, the thing that we need, it, need to really focus on. And so it's not that either or, right? There is these time horizons that we need to think a little bit, waves of impact that we need to think about. 